Now, before we get started, I'll introduce our speaker. Dr. Daniel Vogt is an assistant professor in the College of Human Medicine's Department of Pediatrics and Human Development at Michigan State University. Dr. Vogt's lab is investigating the molecular and cellular mechanisms underlying autism. Dr. Vogt's lab is focusing on understanding how inhibitory neurons develop and function. In addition, they seek to understand how differences discovered in some genes affect function. These webinars are made possible thanks to generous donor support. If you'd like to contribute, please visit our website at autism.org. And now I will turn this over to Dr. Vogt. Thank you very much and I appreciate everyone attending today. Um, as described in the background, something uh, my lab is very interested in is trying to use um, rare disease monogenic syndromes uh, with elevated rates of autism to try to understand uh, if we can find common underlying uh, causes uh, for autism and other uh, neuropsychiatric disorders. So the big question that I want to ask is, what are the molecular and cellular underpinnings of autism spectrum disorder symptoms? Um, and really, can we begin to use something um, advantageous to us, like monogenic syndromes, where we actually know this, where a single gene is mutated, to identify these potential cellular and molecular candidates. So I always like to start by talking about how far we've come in identifying autism candidate genes. Um, so as you probably know, autism uh, might be caused by both environmental and genetic causes. The genetic causes have been highly identified really over the last two decades. And within these genes, there are actually a lot of um, different categories of genes that we can really break down. So three big hubs that we think about um, inside the cell that might lead to autism are genes that code for proteins at the synapse. Uh, there are several nuclear genes, but there's also a lot of genes that do what's called cell cellular signaling. Um, and what this is, is these are genes that might even link events at the cell surface or synapse to nuclear events or other um, you know, regulatory things that go on inside the cell. And this is really where my lab um, has done a lot of its work. Uh, I find it very interesting because I view the cell signaling as something that can actually link all three of these together. So the two big pathways that I'm gonna talk about today are the mammalian uh, target rapamycin and the MAP kinase pathways. Both of these are signaling cascades that respond to a stimulus um, to actually lead to things like cellular growth, cellular division, migration. Um, they're very potent pathways and they're highly important during development. The thing though is we have to shut them down as we get older. We don't want uncontrolled growth. Because of that, both of these pathways are also linked to cancer if they're mutated in certain ways. What my lab uh, has really been interested in is understanding how different uh, genes that code proteins in these pathways, uh, what the mutations in these genes do, as well as how they contribute to different um, uh, developmental brain events. So the ones I'm going to talk about today are P10, which inhibits the mTOR pathway at the very beginning, and TSC1. TSC1 is part of a complex with TSC2 that inhibits the mTOR pathway at later stages. Both of these are considered autism risk genes. Um, P10 is actually one of the top ones that has been identified. Both of them inhibit the pathway. And so when we mutate these today, what we're gonna do is hyperactivate this pathway. And in addition to cellular growth division and all these things, um, at the mechanistic level, mTOR is something that actually kind of um, promotes translational regulation as well. So the rap -map -map kinase pathway, also a pro-growth pathway, um, it is inhibited by NF1 at the very early stages that I'll talk about today. And then other genes in the pathway, once, it, um, once the pathway is activated, there's a cascade that usually terminates on ERK1 and 2. ERK1 and 2 can then go on to phosphorylate other candidates in um, the cytoplasm, but it can also lead to nuclear regulation of genes. So it can actually control transcription. And the big question I wanna ask is what are the common biological changes in these mutants? Uh, and are they common? Can we find um, 
basically cell, cellular and molecular changes that might be shared between these pathways. So what I'm going to use as a model system today are mouse GABAergic cortical interneurons. Um, these are some of the primary um, inhibitory cells uh, in the, uh, the brain. Um, they basically constitute, uh, although not many of the cells uh, in the brain, maybe only 10, 10 or 20% of all the, the neurons in the brain, um, but they have incredibly uh, diverse properties that make their ratios and their numbers incredibly important. So <clears throat> these cortical interneurons, or CINs as I'll call them today, um, they're basically born in waves from about mid-gestation to early postnatal ages um, in the MGE and the CGE located here. Um, and these are the medial and caudal ganglionic eminences. Um, the MGE generates roughly 70% of all the interneurons um, and these will express markers like the calcium binding protein parvalbumin or the peptide somatostatin. The CGE is also very important. It only generates about 20% of the CANs. Um, but again, they have very unique properties and without them, the circuit would not be the same. <laughs> And just to give you an idea of what this looks like, so if we were to take a snapshot in the micro circuit up here in the somatosensory cortex, a lot of the MGE cells populate layers according to their birth. So we're going to talk about a lot today about the somatostatin neurons and the parvalbumin neurons. And what I hope you can appreciate from this figure right away is that just where they project in the brain and how they regulate excitatory cells um, is unique to the cell type involved. Um, in addition to this, they have highly various um, uh, electrical properties and molecular uh, milieu that gives them very unique roles in the circuit. And to make it more complicated, there's even lots of subtypes of each one of these that we're just now learning about. So where do these interneurons come from and how does uh, development work? We This is what we think about when we start looking at uh, new interneurons. And basically, I, I think about it as four major events that we study for each of these genes. Early on, we have cell proliferation and then apoptosis a little later. So again, this starts about embryonic day uh, 9 to 11. These cells are born in the MGE that we're gonna talk about today. After they're born, they undergo um, a very unique cell migration. So they have to migrate very long distances to get the, to their final targets in the brain, unlike um, excitatory neurons, which radially migrate within a column. As they're doing all this, they have to acquire unique properties that give them their cell fate. Um, and this is something that is still intensely studied in the field. And then finally, because they're neurons, they have to acquire electrical properties in order to synapse with other neurons in the brain and receive synapses from others uh, to make the microcircuit. And because of the many waves that come out of the MGE, as well as the long migration distances, we think that CINs can be vulnerable to many incidents just due to the prolonged uh, timeline of development. Mm. And there are some examples in the brain as well. For example, this is um, a study looking at uh, human brains that were diagnosed with autism for three different um, markers of interneurons. And what they found is in, in autism spectrum disorder brains, you'll notice the magenta color is less over here. These are the parvalbumin interneurons that were counted from three different pregma areas of these brains, while other markers were not changed, the blue and the brown. And in addition to autism, you know, interneurons have been in, uh, implicated in other disorders as well, like epilepsy and schizophrenia. And just to be, you know, um, fair, interneurons aren't the only thing causing that might be causing autism. I think a lot of other cell types are involved. Um, but what we're going to try to understand is can we figure out what's going on in, in an interneuron when we make these changes, or make these uh, genetic mutations? And I just wanted to bring this up. This is, this is a new idea, but I, I really like this paper because it's, it's another way of thinking about 
what are one of the many ways in which uh, you know autism symptoms could arise? Uh, and this one's called the parvalbumin hypothesis of autism, where either parvalbumin downregulation or maybe even disruption of a parvalbumin neuron might be one of the uh, root causes um, of symptoms of autism. So today, what I'm gonna talk about are what I like to think of as a broad picture of, of my work over the last like nine to 10 years. Um, I wanted to do this because I think we're now getting a better understanding of the pathways uh, that we've been studying and not just you know single genes. Um, so to that end, what I'm gonna do is give highlights from various studies and talk about how I think all of this um, tells us a story about the two signaling pathways. So for the most part, um, we're going to be using a Cree line called NKX 2.1 for most, but not all, of our genes. NKX 2.1 is um, an MGE um, determinant, basically. It, it, uh, you'll find it in the progenitors of the MGE cells, which are here. And anything that Cree is expressed in, any of these lineages, including the parvalbumin and somatostatin interneurons, um, will be impacted by the gene losser activity. We're going to look at several genes. Most of these are uh, LOXP to go in combination with the Cree. And then we'll also be using an AI14 fluorescent reporter. So anytime Cree is expressed, we'll have the TD tomato protein uh, active in those cells, and that's what you're noticing over here. So the mutants that we're going to look at again are P10 and TSC1. So for mTOR, we'll be looking at hyperactivity of the pathway by deleting these genes. For the MAP kinase pathway, we have the advantage of looking at both. So we'll hyperactivate the pathway by deleting NF1 or expressing an active form of BRAF or MAC1. Um, and then I also want to say thanks to our collaborators, Jason Newburn at Arizona State University. Uh, Jason uh, has also done studies with MEC1 and ERP1 and 2. And um, I'm going to show a little data from a recent study that we worked on together um, that I think complements the overactivity of the pathway by loss of function of ERP1 and 2. And so most of our counts and studies today will be in the mature somatosensory cortex. This is just an example of what it looks like at about postnatal day 35. So part one, we'll be assessing the mTOR signaling pathway. So again, we're deleting P10 or TSC1. Both of these mutants lead to elevated activity of this pathway. And so the question is, what is the consequence oops, of that on interneuron development? So one of the things that we found while doing these studies um, is that mTOR signaling, which is identified here by phospho S6, this is a target of mTOR, uh, is much higher in parvalbumin cells labeled here rather than somatostatin cells. So this already gave us a hint that the pathway, at least in wild type cells, um, was, not, um, was not the same between the two interneuron subtypes. Uh, and that was kind of a surprise because this is a pretty ubiquitous pathway um, in the brain, but in interneurons, it seems to be, um, again, more active in parvalbumin cells. One of the first genes we knocked out was P10, again, using this NKX 2.1 Cree for all the MGE cells. And there were already several phenotypes uh, with loss of P10 that could tell us that the circuit itself might have been very messed up. Uh, for one, we had less overall cells. Um, and in this study, we had found that we were losing cells due to increased apoptosis. Um, usually not something you find with overacting the, overactivating the mTOR pathway, but in this case we did. Um, of the cells that were left over, there was a greater number of parvalbumin cells compared to somatostatin. So the ratio was also different. And what was intriguing is that these parvalbumin axons were going into layer one. And this is a layer where they normally don't go into. So the circuit itself at the, the wiring level was off. This prompted us to look into the electrical activity of, of cells. And our collaborators in the lab of Vikas Sohal 
went in and patched onto the excitatory cells to see how much inhibitory input they were getting. And in the knockouts, they were actually getting way more inhibitory input. So there was this increased inhibitory tone. Now, since we knocked out P10 from progenitors and we lost a lot of the cells, we wanted to know if some of these things could still happen, um, if we could find a way to not kill off ourselves. And so the first thing we did is we wanted to develop a way of looking at uh, missense mutants. And then after this, we wanted to try different pre-lines um, with the TSC line to see if we could recapitulate the phenotypes. So what we did first um, to look at these missense variants in P10 was we dissected out MGE tissue at an embryonic age when we know there's a lot of progenitors. These were treated with viruses um, that bias expression and GABAergic neurons um, to either knock out P10 to see if we could recapitulate the phenotypes or replace P10 with a human variant. Um, and by doing this, we can allow these cells to develop in vivo. We'll take them out to a similar age that we analyze the other tissue. And then we can ask a few questions. And the big one is, are these human variants dominant interfering, or are they loss of function? And it was really a test to see if we could develop this assay because missense variants in these genes are high in number, but incredibly hard to predict uh, function. And this is the results of this. So these are fluorescent images showing examples of the transplanted cells in red and then co-stained with parvalbumin in green. Uh, and what we found is that if we express um, P10 in wild-type cells, so this is the test to see if this is uh, dominant interfering, P10 reduces parvalbumin expression compared to um, just a wild-type cell that got pre only and no P10 only. However, we tested five human variants, and none of these did the same thing. Now, in the complementation or rescue assay, we knocked out the mouse P10 and then replaced it with the human variant. So if we just knock out the gene, we get this elevated parvalbumin expression, similar to the increased ratio we saw on the mouse. Wild type P10 rescues this back down to around wild type levels, but the variants do not. Um, the, so this told us that the variants can't function like P10 and were loss of function. Uh, and it gave us our first answer for studying human uh, variants in a system like this. So then after doing this, we wanted to move on to another gene and try to, try to go back in, in um, the tissue and see how we can manipulate TSC1. Um, and of course, our big question was, since this was one of our first studies, is this unique to P10 or is it a bigger picture of the mTOR pathway? So we decided to go uh, with a CRE that expresses in post-mitotic somatostatin neurons. Uh, it turns on very early but it is not in progenitors. And luckily we avoided um, losing our cells to apoptosis like we did with the PTEP line. So when we did counts of the cells at adult, we didn't see any difference in the number of cells. Uh, these are examples of the, uh, the red cells here are again, your Cre lineage and it's co-stained in, in green with either somatostatin or parvalbumin. And so, as expected for the mTOR pathway, these cells got bigger. Uh, normally this, uh, they have uh, increased growth compared to their wild type um, counterparts. We didn't see any change in the level of somatostatin expression in these cells, but there, there was a cohort of these that started to express parvalbumin. So to us, this was really exciting because we are still trying to figure out the cell fate um, uh, events that give you a parvalbumin uh, interneuron. And so to have this ectopic phenotype uh, gave us a chance to really ask um, questions like, how is this happening and uh, what are the properties? And so to that end, we got some, uh, so we got some initial data uh, looking into the mTOR hyperactivity and what this could mean. So P10 and TSC1 uh, lead to more parvalbumin expression. 
Um, if you knock out P10 early, like in progenitors, uh, and cause hyperactivity then, we also lose somatostatin cells. But you don't lose this if you knock it out in somatostatin neurons when they're post-mitotic. So there's also a timing to this that we still are working on. And again, most genetic variants that we've tested so far in P10, as well as TSC1, uh, are turning up to be loss of function rather than dominant interfering. So after finishing these two studies, we were also simultaneously trying to understand the RASMAP kinase pathway and look at similar um, uh, readouts, basically. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what we did is we deleted the NF1 gene or constitutively activated um, a BRAF allele. And both of these will result in hyperactivity of the pathway. And then our collaborator, Jason Newborn, studied a MEK1 constitutively active Again, that would hyperactivate the pathway. And he deleted both ERK1 and 2. Um, in their work, this was led by graduate students Michael Holter and Sarah Knowles, uh, who I had the privilege to work with as well. And so what I'm going to talk about first is the NF1 deletion. So hyperactive MAP, MAP kinase, if we get rid of NF1, uh, one of the first things we found is that it actually led to us having more somatostatin cells uh, rather than parvalbumin. And just like the previous study, we wanted to know if hyperacting the pathway through a different gene in the pathway would also result in a similar phen phenotype. And this is the case. When we express the hyperactive BRAF mutant, we also see an increase in somatostatin. Um, this was done a little differently. We did this in vitro, but we've also confirmed this um, in vivo in the tissue. And this is just um, uh, looking at a quantification of these uh, counts. Now, in addition to finding increases in somatostatin in these two lines, we were also looking for several other markers. I'll talk about more in the future, but one important one that we think um, uh, is going to turn out to be really important is loss of a transcription factor called ARX. So this is the Aristolus homeobox transcription factor. It's very important for MGE and CGE development, uh, including migration and some sulfate properties. Mm -hmm. and so if you look here, you can see the labeling of the TD tomato cells again. This is the Cree lineage. And then ARX sustained in uh, cyan here. What I hope you can appreciate is that both in the NF1 knockout and the BRAF knockout, there's a pretty uh, decent reduction in both the number of cells as well, qualitatively, in the intensity of staining. So next, we wanted to go in vivo and start looking at our cell fate markers, parvalbumin and somatostatin there. So we first looked at the NF1 mutants here. So this is just showing uh, parvalbumin staining in a wild type, an NF1 hat, and an NF1 knockout. And what I hope you can appreciate here is that there was a pretty drastic reduction um, in the number of uh, parvalbumin expressing cells. Um, there are other phenotypes that I won't get into detail today, but including um, elevated oligodendrocytes. But this uh, reduction was almost more than 50%. In addition to this, we noticed that there was a little bit of a shift in how the neurons were located. So when we counted the laminar positions, there seems to be a little more um, uh, parvalbumin positive cells in some upper layers compared to lower layers. Now, this again might be just an additional uh, insult to the circuit because the cells are not placed where they normally would be. And this is a phenotype that I, I feel pretty confident saying is caused by the pathway itself because uh, when we looked at BRAF um, constitutively active. And when uh, Jason Newburn's lab looked at MET1 constitutively active, they also showed uh, their 50% or greater reduction of parvalbumin. So that gave us three different hyperactive mutants with the same phenotype. So we felt pretty confident this was uh, due to hyperactivity in MET kinase. So what about loss of function of MET kinase? So I told you before 
that we have this loss of parvalbumin and we have an increase of uh, somatostatin. Um, so can we get rid of MAP kinase signaling and see if uh, this pathway is even necessary uh, for somatostatin expression? And yes, it is. Um, this was again done by Jason Newburn's lab. Um, and what they found is that if they delete both ERK1 and 2 uh, to create these conditional double mutants, um, the levels of parvalbumin are actually pretty normal. But somatostatin expression is greatly decreased. And they quantified this at two different ages. Uh, and in both ages, they saw a decrease in somatostatin. So, um, and this is without changing parvalbumin expression. Um, so this was really interesting because now it gave us two sides of the same coin. They have both overexpression and underexpression of the pathway, or excuse me, hyperactivation and decreased activity of the pathway. And it seems like the, the dosage of the pathway signal corresponds to levels of somatostatin. So just to reiterate, if we cause mutations that hyperactivate this pathway, we're getting more somatostatin and less parvalbumin expression. And if we decrease the pathway by deleting ERK1 and 2, there's less somatostatin, but there's no change in parvalbumin. And one of the things, we, we think this is happening because both somatostatin and parvalbumin neurons come from similar MGE progenitors. And some of our data is suggesting that the overproduction of somatostatin early in development might be outcompeting the ability to make enough P10 later. That's why when you have less somatostatin, we think this is why when you have less somatostatin in this mutant, parvalbumin is not effective. But when you're overproducing somatostatin, it just gives you less chances of making a parvalbumin cell. So what I've done so far is try to present uh, the work over these last years, um, looking into all these genes, trying to understand what the overall function of the pathway is. Um, but a lot of what I presented to you are just molecular markers. They don't actually tell you that a cell has changed its function. So are there other ways in which we can ask, is this changing a cell's fate and properties? Or are we just modulating you know, a single marker in a cell? And there is a question here. Have similar studies been completed on primates? Um, <clears throat> to the best of my knowledge, I, I don't think so. There have been um, there have been studies in human and primates where they have looked at um, uh, cellular migration of interneurons, but not to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if anyone's looked at these uh, syndromic genes. But I'm happy to talk more about that um, a little later. So something else that we can look at are the electrical properties of these two interneurons. So um, part of, a lot of part of human cells, I, I shouldn't say all, but um, they're considered to be what's called fast spiking. So if you measure their action potential frequency over time, um, these part of human neurons will uh, fire at very high speeds and they don't really slow down. Uh, they're, 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 I don't know if you remember the Energizer Bunny, but that's what these cells are. Um, somatostatin neurons, a lot of them have slower spiking. Has, we call this regular spiking um, dynamics, and this is just what it looks like. Um, but they can't fire as fast as they are about human interneurons. So we can look at these firing properties to see if these might also be changing um, in our various mutants. And our hypothesis is that mTOR hyperactive mutants would be more fast spiking since we see more parvalbumin expression um, and vice versa. We might see more slowing down or regular spiking in somatostatin um, mutants that are hyperactive, uh, excuse me, hyperactive kinase mutants that have more somatostatin expression. And what we're really trying to test here again is did we just change a marker on a cell or is there something bigger going on in the cell that we should spend more time on? And, um, and more studies? And the answer is yes. Um, so again, elevated mTOR mutants, um, when we looked at these, um, TSC hats and knockouts uh, started to resemble more fast spiking um, as a population. And this is just quantified here. So the red here is our knockouts. 
this is giving more and more current over time. So the more current you give, the faster they should spike until they hit kind of a plateau. And what we find is that you can make these mutant cells spike very fast. The hets are kind of intermediate. And this is what a wild type population looks like. Now, in a different study, and I want to thank uh, my colleagues, Michael William and Preet Saman, uh, who are here at MSU. Um, they recorded from our hyperactive MAP kinase mutants. And what they found is that different currents, this is what the cells look like. Um, but the BRAF mutants that they studied, they could never reach the same firing frequency as the wild type cells. And this is quantified here. So there's a slowing down of kinetics in these. And this goes right along with, you know, a bigger cell fate property um, phenotype going on rather than just us changing one marker or two markers. And so for this first part of the talk, um, what we've really done, I think, is over several studies, we've now come to some common changes in the mTOR pathway and common changes in the MAP kinase pathway that I think are important for cellular um, fate and properties and how they might function in a circuit. Um, again, we still have a lot of studies to do to understand if this is translational in nature or transcriptional, and this is something that we're very interested in. Um, but to just give you a quick summary. So again, we think parvalbumin cortical interneuron properties are again promoted by hyperactive activity of this pathway and maybe regular activity of this pathway. While activity of the MAP kinase pathway gives you more somatostatin um, cortical interneuron properties. Um, and honestly, I don't think we could have done this with one gene. We really needed to study multiple genes. And the loss of function of ERP12 is also very supportive for this being um, not only a mutation causing phenotype, but also a necessary you know, developmental um, component uh, of this, uh, these observations. So after doing this, and I, I want to use these final slides to kind of pitch an idea um, on how we're, how we're going about trying to learn more about autism behaviors and how the molecular and cellular things that we're finding uh, may or may not be involved with autism symptoms or if there's something novel to the syndrome itself. And what we're trying to do now is link um, different behaviors that we're finding in our mouse models uh, to these molecular and cellular changes. So we went back to one of our hyperactive MAP kinase models, our NF1 deletion. Um, so a lot of the behaviors um, that we're finding um, seem to be more hyperactive and reduced sense of danger um, in this model. Um, and these have been pretty consistent. This has been done by um, lab manager, April Stafford, who's been uh, doing this for a while and has done a great job blinded. Um, but three things that we have noticed are that when we put mice in an elevated plus maze, um, they spend a lot more time in the open arms and usually the, the wild types and heads don't. In an open field, they're much faster. So as a group, a lot of them go faster than their uh, wild type or head neighbors. And in a Y maze, normally this is um, something that we use to test short-term memory. Um, it was hard to do that because what they're doing is running around in the maze really fast. Um, so pretty much every test we put them in, they're running very fast, they're very hyper. Um, and this is what we're now looking into to understand if any of our molecular changes might underlie this. And so I mentioned earlier that ARX was decreased in NF1 and BRAF mutants, but there's also a lot of other candidates. So. I'll come back to this question. Uh, there's a question about in autism, there's no sense of danger. Is this the reason why? I, I think this is interesting to discuss. Um, in this model, this could be one thing we could we could try to to look into in that. Um, but let, let's uh, let me come back at the end and let's talk about that. <clears throat> so what we did is we took kind of um, an approach to look at all the major factors. Uh, I shouldn't say all, but many of the major players 
in cortical interneuron development in our NF1 and BRAF mutants. Um, so we just did a four-brain dissection and did Western blots for several of these markers. Um, so each two, this is wild type, NF1 HET, NF1 knockouts, and BRAF constitutively active. Um, some of the changes include increases in GAD65 and 67. These are the enzymes necessary to make GABA, uh, which the, is the inhibitory neurotransmitter. Um, one of the strongest phenotypes we have is a decrease in LHX6. LHX6 is a transcription factor expressed um, in the MGE, and it's necessary to make um, parvalbumin and somatostatin interneurons. And in addition to the ARX decreasing, we also had an increase in SAP-B1 protein. SAP-B1 is another transcription factor, and there's a few studies out there um, claiming that SAP-B1 uh, it underlies um, the, an increase in somatostatin, I'm sorry, it's necessary for somatostatin interneuron development. Um, <clears throat> so with these four factors, we now have at least four tangible measurements that we can look at if we start manipulating the map kinase pathway. And so, and again, our question is, can we rescue these molecular phenotypes? And if we can, do they correlate with any behavioral risk use? So this is the, um, what we're doing right now. Um, there is an FDA-approved drug in 2020 called selumetinib. It's supposed to be an improved uh, MEK inhibitor. So we generated a diet that had this drug in it and fed it to mice for five days. Um, I'm only going to show a little bit of the data here, but um, we're doing it at multiple um, developmental windows as well to try to understand if there's an optimal age. Oh, I apologize um, for the uh, the acronyms. I'll do I'll do better <laughs> going through that. Um, <clears throat> so, what we did again was we we took brain tissue and did Western blots uh, to probe for proteins. Um, and what we wanted to understand is. Uh, what happens to, first of all, is the diet even working? Does it get into the brain? So when we take brain tissue um, from both our wild type mice and our mutant mice, um, what, so in the presence of no drug, the phosphorylated form of ERK is elevated. So the phosphorylated form of ERK, this means is active. Um, and this is all the ERK present. So if you see it, a darker band here, what this means is that the pathway is actually highly activated. And in the presence of the drug, we found that these bands actually return to what a normal mouse um, would look like. And this is just quantified down here. So again, if you only have the mutant brain, you have elevated activity, which we would expect um, for both of these bands. And the drug is able to bring this back down to mostly um, normal brain levels. So what we decided to do next, um, these are actually ongoing studies, so we don't have all the numbers that we need yet. Um, but we let the mice, uh, basically a P here means postnatal, so this is the day of birth. Uh, we let the mice go 55 days. This would be like um, a young adult mouse. And then we gave it the drug for several days. Then we test on like days 60 to 62, because it takes a few days to do all these tests. Um, and what we found is the diet seems to be effective at restoring some of these behaviors. So this top one here, what you're looking at are NF1, wild type pets and knockouts um, with no, no diet. And again, the knockouts have this elevated time and the elevated plus minus. And we don't have enough in here, but we think that um, observationally, that's looking good that when they're eating the diet, um, their behaviors are, are getting uh, more normal. And <clears throat> the other good thing, too, is that if you give a wild-type mouse this diet, we're not seeing um, a reaction from the diet compared to wild-type. Um, the one that's looking pretty good right now is this Y maze. So this is the one where the, the mice would run around really fast um, in the maze. And again, wild-type had the knockout. You had see more hyperactivity, but... In the knockout that's eating the diet, we're now seeing this start to look more normal, like um, the wild types and the, the hats. 
Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier, we have these various markers uh, that were changed in the mutants. So we wanted to understand if, you know, eating the diet with this drug would also, um, Oh yeah, let me let me answer that. So why is the knockout shell number so low? Um, right now, we're trying to collect more. Um, we would like to get this number up to this number. When we breed these mice, it's not always easy to get knockouts. Um, so we we basically uh, take what Mendel gives us. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, our hope is to at least double this by the time the study is complete. But um, with the number we have right now, it's already looking good. But yeah, it's just a it's a chance at getting the genotypes when you breed the mice together. And finally, what we looked at were uh, these molecular markers. So, so far, um, I don't think all the markers are changing, um, but we do have one that is looking good so far. And again, this is an ongoing study, um, but ARX that I mentioned earlier, um, you can see it co-localizing here with the magenta cells. These are all the cells that came from the MG. Uh, and this is at a late embryonic stage. In our knockout, we had a lot less of these. But in our, in our um, knockout with drug, we're now seeing a lot more of these cells labeled. Um, and this is quantified over here. So it's looking good so far. But again, we have to get more um, animals analyzed uh, before we can make a good call. But so far, we think visually it's looking good and the numbers are starting to look good. Um, so in turn, it, you know, other things we can do are try to see if we can do the same strategy using rapamycin to inhibit the other signal pathway, mTOR, um, in our hyperactive mutants. Um, and the goal there would be to look for, again, markers like this that are changed to see if they correlate with any change behaviors. And so, and our future studies are really now trying to do this. Uh, to also try to repurpose FDA approved drugs in, uh, to understand if these molecular markers correlate with behaviors. And with that, I looks like I'm gonna end a little early, but I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Um, I wanna thank, uh, especially the Autism Research Institute who funded our BRAF um, NF1 work, uh, the DOD who um, is funding our cellumentinib work. Um, that's the um, the MAP kinase inhibitor drug. And we also have support now from CFC International. I think them, they're going to allow us to look at very common BRAF variants that cause CFC, which we just started. And um, my my uh, my startup funds from Spectrum House, MSU Alliance, now Corwell Health. Um, April Stafford did um, a lot of this work and is our lab manager, on especially all the behavior. I um, want to thank our new graduate student, Dari, um, uh, Luke, Alyssa, and Jenna. These are all um, individuals who have uh, joined the lab and are each taking on um, some of these projects. Um, and again, thanks to Michael Williams here at MSU um, and his postdoc, Tariq, for doing the uh, ETHA's work, um, and Jason Newbern and Sarah Knowles, who have been good colleagues of, um, as well, uh, Arizona State University, who collaborated with us on our kinase of studies and we helped them with, with a few things as well. Uh, so with that, yeah, I'd like to take any questions. All right. Okay, so people are typing questions into the Q&A section. Um, I did have a question about getting continuing education credits. We do have a knowledge quiz that will be available after the webinar. You have to check with your organizing body to see if they'll accept a certificate of of participation, but the hours will be marked on there along with Dr. Vogt's name and the title of the talk. So if you'd like to take that, the link is in the in the webinar chat. It was also in your reminder email that you received earlier today. So typing questions into the Q&A, it looks like there's some a few here. The first one is when kids with autism do not have a sense of danger, do you feel like any of your research is elucidating why that might be? That's a big question. I don't That's want to be this one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Honestly, um, I, I really don't know if these markers are what's causing it, but this is our first attempt to, to look into markers um, that correlate with behaviors. Um, again, it's a correlation right now, so this needs to be tested. Um, but I think it's interesting that we are getting kind of a, you know, 
an effect using the map kinase drug on our mice. Now, is that going to be general to other types of autism? I don't know. I don't know. Um, but more than likely, what's happening here is we are we're messing up some circuit in the brain that affects that behavior. And there's probably lots of different ways you can mess up the same circuit. And this might just be one insight and, you know, maybe it will allow us to know what that circuit is, uh, something like that. But again, it's still early times and, um, you know, we, we have a lot more to do. But yeah, that was a great question though. I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer. Right, looking for those translational answers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so the next question is just about finding sources to learn the basics. I know that we you had said about the acronyms. Um, is there yeah, a so. place where people can, I, somebody mentioned it might be good to take a, a college course in molecular and cellular biology, but do you know, is there an easy way to look these up? Is Google useful? Like what are ways that people can do that? We do have the handouts online for, for folks who want to look at them. If Google would probably be the best. If you type in the acronym and something like MG or interneuron, it would probably help with that. Um, if you ever come across a research paper and read the introduction, the first time they define this, they'll also spell out what it is. My apologies, I should have done better. But... Well, that'll, that'll uh, be a goal for next time. <laughs> there you go. Um, this person's asking, I'm not sure exactly the context here. They're saying, would you give this lecture if there was no correlation? Um, that's a good question. Uh, yes, I would. Because I, I think just there's there's a few things here. We, if there was no correlation between the molecular and the behavior, it's still important to know about it. Um, and it it basically what it tells us is that these molecular markers are probably doing something else. They may not be correlated. Um, but it's I think it's still good to know because uh, based on what I've read, um, there's a lot of behavior out there with. Um, these models as well as other um, models, but there's very little known about the molecular and cellular changes in the brain. So even knowing that in this model and not even having a behavioral correlation at this point is still worth it. Um, All right, next question. How are you narrowing your selection of potential repurposed molecules for this and future studies? Um, we're doing it in a few ways. Um, we chose this one because it had just been FDA approved, um, and it seemed, and it, it, there, it, there were reports that it would get into the brain, uh, which can be an issue with a lot of the, um, drugs out there. Um, but for future studies, what we're doing, and maybe this will answer another question too, um, we're trying to take a more unbiased approach in how we choose the genes to go after that are changed. And something um, our student Dari has done is gone through the list of genes that are we know changed in a model and make a list of all the FDA approved drugs that might work or for or not for it. Um, so we're trying to we're trying to take a broader approach with the genes and then come back to really good targets. And the targets that we really go after, they have to match the phenotype. Like if we know something, uh, I can give you an example from another model we have. We have a model where the long processes that come out of the neurons called axons are very stunted. They're not growing. So we have a gene list of several genes that are changed and many of those regulate axon outgrowth. So we're shortening the list based on what matches the phenotype in our brains. And then we're trying to go from there. Um, okay, great. This next question, well, actually a couple comments. People are saying this was great, thank you. And another one, uh, really interesting work. I look forward to reading more of your work. So a couple, that's actually from another grant recipient at ARI. So terrific. Um, this next person is, it's a longer question. So I'm going to read through it. Okay. Why ELP2 was not included in the map of major autism cellular hubs presented at the start of the presentation. So asking that question. And therefore it was ignored in the research. Um, this person saying that they're aware of um, incidents where ELP2 mutations were present in both parents and that maybe that is not a major cellular hub. Uh, so any thoughts about that? Why that one? It's a good, no, it's a good point. Um, so the very first paper came out of a paper from 2015 when people were starting to categorize these. I don't know why the authors chose not to add ELP. Maybe it wasn't uh, very well known then, I'm not sure. Um, and of course, I, I only talked about the genes that we study today, but it's a good point. It's, uh, you know, every rare disease gene out there, um, 
I hope someone is studying it, looking into it. There's just so many, though, that sometimes they don't always make it on our list. But yeah. Hey, uh, this is a couple more compliments here. Really, really interesting. This is really accurate information that I did not know about before. So thank you. Um, this person's asking, what would your intake be about acquired features of autism due to physiological and me molecular complications? Um, that's a good question. Hey, you know, acquired. I mean, my, I think my general, I can give a kind of a big answer. I don't know if I'm interpreting the question exactly perfectly here. Um, but, you know, all the symptoms, the behavioral symptoms that are going on are probably caused by the brain being rearranged a little differently or not acting well. Now, for physiological, I, I can think at, um, I can think of neurons talking to each other and, and, and brains that are diagnosed with autism, uh, you know, the voices might be a little different or they might communicate at different distances. And that alone might cause us or cause our brains to act just a little differently. Uh, molecular, the same way. Um, again, I, I think in one of the first slides, I said there's the synapse, so that's at the cell surface. There's cellular signaling that's mostly inside the cell. And then there's the core, there's the nucleus. So how all three of these talk to each other, if there's any molecular changes at any of those levels, the cell is probably gonna act a little differently. Um, and the same thing with our brain. Our brains are an interconnected circuit. So, you know, if anything happens to that cir circuit anywhere, you know, you might have the same behavioral impact, even though you might be affecting it a hundred different ways. 